Hi. How's it going, everyone? Oh, I'm so excited for this. Um, so I am Stacey Wilson Hunt. I work for New York Magazine and Vulture, based here in Hollywood. I see you guys frequently, and I love coming here. And I'm very honored to introduce a man I love as a performer and a friend. He doesn't get much better than Jeffrey. So bring out Jeffrey Tambor, please. Oh, no, don't do that. <laughs> I told you they were going to like you. That's very kind. <laughs> Backstage, you. he said, what if I'm terrible tonight? And, and I said, you wouldn't be Jeffrey if you didn't think something Are you okay that I have my Dunkin' Donuts? <laughs> <laughs> I'm from This New is York. not a paid advertisement for Dunkin'. So, <laughs> so you've, been, you've been very, well, hello, by the way. Hello. It's good to see you again. Hello. Uh, so you've been very busy the last few months, to say the least. Mm. You had a memoir published, mm. which I have here. Have you guys read this? It's amazing. Are you anybody? You got your third nomination, Emmy nomination for Transparent. Yes, very exciting. And you also earned a star in the Walk of Fame last week. Very exciting. So how does all this recognition feel after all these years of working so hard? Interesting you should say that. Um, um, I, I, I'm the Jewish son of Russian-Hungarian parents. So my dad would always say, if anything, uh, any Jews here? <laughs> uh, um, and, uh, um, there are always a few in the audience, just a few. Yeah. Yeah. My dad <laughs> term, always would say, shh, 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 don't say anything, don't say anything. And his, his constant lament was, uh, don't celebrate, they'll take it away from you. And you have to understand the lineage and going back, and that it, they did take it away from you. It, you did not speak. In, in the community. You did not speak outside the house. And uh, so getting a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, is, I was perilous. And then I write a memoir, and it says I'm, I'm, I'm breaking every commandment in the, in the, in the thing. But um, it's uh, very interesting. And what did you learn about yourself writing the book that surprised you? I, I asked Andrea Martin this question a few months ago. She had written a book. And I loved her response. She said, I didn't realize how many problems I had until I actually sat down to write a book, which is very Andrea. What happened was once I dipped back into it, uh, I started remembering. And uh, I don't know if anybody's uh, ever done that, but once you start pulling that chain, you, you, it, it, it comes. And it's very, very freeing. And uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of memories, a lot of details, a lot of... Um, a lot of things, and uh, I decided to go, not memoir, I decided to just do, just, it wasn't born on, It's almost you know, thematic chapters, not yeah. so much chronology, yeah. which I thought was... Nice. Um, it's very much written by an actor. It's very much written by a father, uh, and a husband, and a citizen, uh, and I tried to give it that, you know, tried to say what, it, what it's like. And obviously we can't get into your life as a whole because we don't have time. But if you could... <laughs> Why not? <laughs> we, we have so many things to get to. Um, but you've, but you've, you've intimated a little bit with sort of like the mood in your home was sort of... seem like you have very supporting parents, very supportive parents, loving family. Did you read my book? I did. No. You got supportive out I of did. that? I did. I did. I did. Did you read it front to back or back to front? Well... I like this quote. This is, this is one of my favorite quotes. You said, the great cellist Yo-Yo Ma once said that you have to have a fire in the belly to be an artist. Same goes for being an actor. It's not enough to just want to be an actor, you have to have the fire. And you said, I loved my dad, but I was going to prove him wrong. I woke up each morning with a mission with a fire in my belly. Yeah, so that, that's the, and you all know that, that the fire can, it doesn't, it's not always a, uh, nice ambient cloud. The fire can be, you know. Fire remember, burns. It's unpleasant sometimes. Right? Yeah. There was an act. I did, um, I used to have a, a lisp, which I talk about in the book, and I had a, 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 a bilateral lisp, and I talked like this. And, um, and yet I was doing Anthony and Cleopatra at San Francisco State College, of all things. And I played a character named... <laughs> And I played a character named Dersatis, and there was an actor named George Eby. Handsome, and it was during the tie-dyed San Francisco sort of, you know, thing. He was gorgeous. And he played Caesar, and he, he was saying, you know, we, we're holding book. And he said, who art thou? And my, my, my line was, 
there sateth I am called, I said. And he literally went, he went, and Mr. Tyrrell, our teacher, was out there, and he went, <laughs> like that. Aww. And I remember saying to myself, George E.B., I will take you down. <laughs> So you never know, but you know, you never know where that fire will come. So every, that can be a mission statement every day because there's, it's not only George Eby, but all the doubters in your life. You go, well, we've never heard of him, so you win. Like, I've never heard of him. <laughs> so you're saying revenge is the model. Not the though, revenge, so. but, but, but um, I remember my dad, uh, you know, I was watching uh, Jack Parr, that's how old I am, and we were all laughing and everything like that. And I said, I'm going to be on television. And I remember my dad going, ah, oh, Bep. And he was a boxer, and he had a boxing ring. And he hit me. On my, and I, re I remember saying, uh, uh, you know, anyway, cut to. Uh, I was standing off stage, and they said, ladies and gentlemen, I was on The Tonight Show, welcome Jeffrey Tambor. And I think this is why God made a circle, right? You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a thing. Mm. Yeah. Great. Are we clapping for God? <laughs> what are we exactly? Oh, I, think, okay. I think what you're saying is resonating with everyone. I think that's, I think that's what we're experiencing. So I, you had such an interesting journey to Hollywood, and I just say Hollywood in terms of doing film and television. You had done, a lot, obviously, a lot of work before that. But your first on-screen appearance was in Kojak, playing a medical examiner in 1977. <laughs> So I, I'm always amazed at how people land that first on-screen appearance. Did you have to audition to play this part? Did you, were you an extra that they said? Yes, and there was a very famous, she, uh, one of the doyens of casting, Alex, I can't remember. Gordon. What? Gordon. Alex Gordon, thank you. And uh, <laughs> she, you know, you, you, I went in and I read, but, and then many months later they called me. It was the coldest winter in New York, uh, by Grant's tomb. I didn't have a stand-in. There was a camera malfunction. Uh, and when they said action, I, I think I was to Joan Hackett. Oh. I think I said, and anyway, it came out. <laughs> All the muscles around my mouth had frozen. So basically, I was a talking anus. <laughs> it was probably like this. And my eyes were bulging. And that baby is out there on CBS <laughs> right now. I mean, and they said, cut, print, moving on. <laughs> and I, rem I remember saying, I have no idea what just happened. <laughs> I am so beyond. I got on the F train to go home. I, I lived on Dean Street in Brooklyn. I hmm. cried and I cried. You lived on Dean Street? No, my daughter lived on Dean Street. <laughs> Every author in the world lived on Dean Street. Jonathan Lethem lived on Dean Street. It's a good street. Good street. Yeah. So, so an experience like that where you thought, you know, I've just ruined my chances, I was terrible, and yet they clearly called you back because you went on to, you know, appear in... Well, Kojak seconds. didn't call me back. Kojak didn't call you back, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, there was no more talking anuses that season. <laughs> so what, how do you move on from there? How, did you just say, okay, I'm just going to keep auditioning? They all know how you move on. You move on. You just go, gulp. Lesson learned, walk, 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 walk. What's the lesson? Walk, 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 walk. And what do you do? You give up and you just, you, you learn. And it's, a, um, you know, it's, that, I mean, that's first audition in New York for a commercial where I walked in and another doyen of commercial casting and, and I said, I'm the father. And she goes, you're the, you're the waiter. And I said, no, I'm the father. I'm from ICM, uh, you're, you're the waiter. And she goes, do you know what a casting director is? <laughs> uh, and she goes, I'm the casting director. And kind of what I say goes. And, uh, uh, and so I, did, I read for the waiter. And I think the line was like, more ice or something. And I came out, I was so awful. <laughs> anyway, I said it. And, and, and I got to the door. And I said, uh, would you like me to leave my uh, picture and resume? And she said, if you must. <laughs> Back on the F train, back to Dean Street, <laughs> another two, day, two days of sobbing. Now we know what the F on the F train stands for. Yeah. <laughs> I used to take that to work, too. 
Air conditioned, first air conditioned train. Loved it, right? Thank God, in the summer, Thank the best, God. absolutely. Yeah. So then, flash forward to 28 episodes on the Ropers, which <laughs> is my favorite thing. The fact Why? That 28 episodes on the, I don't know, because it's hilarious. <laughs> I had no idea what a series was. I had no idea. But I do remember Al Pacino saying this to me, because I told him I was doing the Ropers. I was doing Injustice for All, my first film. And I said, but Al, it's 6,000 a week. And he said, how many steaks can you eat? That's really good advice. Wow. Yeah. And you said, how many, how many can you eat? Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't have the answer to that, but I, I, um, I did 20 episodes instead and did all the craft service I could have. Did you enjoy the multicam comedy experience? No, I hate multicam. Okay. I'm not good at it. Why do you think uh, you're not good at it? Um, it's, um, I'm very, you know, I, I, you know, you said, well, should we talk or anything like that? I love not knowing where I'm going. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, um, I was the guy who underlined every line, including yours, in the script. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew your lines, I knew my lines, I knew what time lunch was and who was serving it and what we were having. <laughs> Um, and that was a bad thing, by the way. And uh, uh, so I like uh, the, the spontaneity. What was your question? No, just why you think you weren't good at the multicam format? Uh, because you rehearsed this. You rehearsed it all week. You rehearsed it all week, and you rehearsed it all week. And 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 it, I, it didn't. It didn't make any sense to me. And I got nervous about the words. I, I just got nervous. And I and don't they're rewriting know. jokes too, and they don't work right on the spot. I don't know. It's just not my thing. I I, I like uh, I like live theater. I like film. Uh, I like uh, stand up. Uh, I like this. I love this. Uh, <laughs> but that thing, I I I'm not good. Uh, I mean, if I were good, it would be great, but I, I looked nervous, and my eyes looked like someone has put a broom up my ass. I, mean, I, looked, I looked like, um, I looked like there's something wrong, you know? I, I, I didn't. You, have, you, you have a presence of worry sometimes. And I just don't get it. You get a lot of money for 20 pages, and it, it just didn't, yeah, it just, it never made sense to me. Hmm. Probably now, you know, uh, uh, it, it would. Hmm. You know. But then you went and on then, to... And then they bust in these people, yeah. and then you go, well, I'm playing to these people. But you're not playing to these people, you're playing to millions of people. Right. I will tell you, though, I had a little problem with me doing the Ropers and things like that. I loved everybody, and Patty and, 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 and Norman and Audra and the whole, the whole, everybody was so great. But uh, I had a little problem because I went, well, this isn't, you know, this isn't Shakespeare, this is the Ropers, and you're getting, I had, I had trouble with it, but when my dad was ailing, and my dad was failing, I remember going into the, uh, um, the cancer ward uh, of the hospital up in San Francisco, and I would go up every weekend to see him, and I remember people watching the show from their beds, wow. while, and I went, you see, everything, everything has a value. You just have to find a place, you know? So that was a big lesson for me. I still think I'm not good at it, you know? Anyhow, I killed the room, didn't I? I just <laughs> murdered the room. <laughs> Might as well leave. That's okay, we'll, we'll jump back in. So after, after the Ropers, you were certainly a, a utility player in tons and tons of comedies. The, the Love Boat, Golden Girls, um, Hill Street Blues, which is obviously not a comedy. Love, excited. <laughs> I couldn't turn my head. I was so ashamed of myself. I, they went, and actually, because you were supposed to go, <laughs> as, as Jack Jones is singing, I, I, my, if you look at you this. You mean in the intro when everyone's like the introducing intro, The intro is yeah. like this. <laughs> I, and I, 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 I was so ashamed I did it twice. I did two love books. But get this, I go on the set one day, this is what's so great about our business, and I go, oh, there's Donald O'Connor. I, mm. I, I went in this business because of Donald O'Connor. Wow. Make him laugh, make him laugh. Mm. Now Donald O'Connor was sitting way over there, and next to him was Sylvia the Seal, <laughs> who was also in the love boat, and he, I guess it was his pet or something. <laughs> By the way, Sylvia Seal, the Seal had third billing. I had fourth billing. <laughs> That's true. I went over, he wasn't overjoyed with my presence that morning because he was with smelly Sylvia the seal. Uh, but then I went over and I went, and I went over to the AD and I said, do you, do you know who that is? And he went, oh, yeah, Gish, Lillian. And over there 
Gish Lillian. I said, <laughs> Gish Lillian is the reason the close-up was invented by D.W. Griffith. That's who's sitting over there. And I went over to Gish Lillian's manager, <laughs> and I said, may I, may I sit ne ne next to Miss Gish? And he said, would you? No one knows who she is. Oh, that's so sad. So, you see, everything has a, everything <sighs> has a thing. Everything has Love a Boat thing. Love definitely pulled out all the stops on its guest star roster. Oh, I know, everybody. Charo, I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> You and Charo were in the same show. Charo and I. <laughs> well, I was in a show with Charo? No, I'm saying you both appeared on The Love Boat. Oh, not okay. at the same time. Right. <laughs> as far as I know. Um, so I was an avid consumer of television as a child in the uh -huh. 80s. Um, and I was very heartened and delighted to see that you did appear in Who's the Boss with your future co-star Judith Light. Right. But you had met her previously. At the Milwaukee Repertory Theater. And you had acted with her at the theater. We did, okay. uh, we did uh, almost, I think, two or three years together. I did five years of repertory in Milwaukee. I did about 12 to 15. Milwaukee, San Francisco. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I loved doing that. Uh, when I graduated from college, I, there was a thing called the TCG. Do you remember that? Yeah. Theater yeah. Communications Group. And you would, I went to audition in Chicago. And mm -hmm. The first one went terribly, but the second time I went, uh, it went very well. And um, I worked for many years off that. I went to Louisville, I went to Seattle, I went to uh, San Diego. Uh, I, I was all over the place. And I loved it. That was my school, basically, uh, doing repertory theater, Re real repertory theater, you know? Uh, and um, I mean, I, in Detroit, we did different play every night for you know, six, eight months. And you really learn when you put, I remember our 12th night was a real stinker. <laughs> it opened and it wasn't ready by the, and, and to learn on your feet, when, and learn, it was one of the strongest shows I've ever been in by the time we closed, you know? That was real, real, real education. But doing me. a show like The Ropers was certainly an adjustment after. You keep something. coming back to The Ropers. <laughs> <laughs> What's up? I just think it's wonderful. <laughs> Well, here's the deal, and, and they can tell you, here's the deal. On your W-2 form as an actor, you write, no matter if it's The Ropers, or The Love Boat, or if it's The Tempest, you write, fall in love. That's our job as actors. And we love acting. The same as, I don't care, I'm a reader, I don't care what I read, I love reading. You understand? So the, 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 the whole life between action and cut is a very interesting life. Mm -hmm. And we're very blessed to have that. The whole thing between, I mean, the, great, the greatest thing I ever heard, uh, and I, I'd never, it was the first night in Seattle when he went, ladies and gentlemen, beginners please. Ladies and gentlemen, places. And I went, ladies and gentlemen, well, you know. <laughs> so uh, that, that's, that, that is the calling card. And I, I do love acting. And, uh, um, um, not a big fan of the business, not, you know, not, not, not a, but I, I do love, love acting. I love that, and I love actors. Uh, I want to say something, because it's, it's come upon me uh, uh, recently. I went to, down to the Kirk Douglas Theater. Uh, uh, I live in New York, but uh, I'm spending a, a, a lot of time. <laughs> one, <laughs> Des Moines. <laughs> uh, I live, uh, I live in New York, but I'm spending a lot of time out here, luckily, because I've been very, very fortunate, very lucky. And um, I went and saw this play, Citizen, I think it came out of the Fountain Theater, and they were at the uh, Center Theater Group. The, and I went, it's come upon me that there are so many actors who are so good. And there was, no, there was not a red carpet to be seen uh, in the vicinity, but there were these actors on the stage just just slamming down. Mm. And you go to these rep, you go to the Guthrie, and you see these productions of Mice and Men, and you go, my God, I can't do what that actor just did. And there are really, really good actors. And now what's happening, and I, I'm, I'm a small part of it, the revolution is back uh, with the streaming. Mm -hmm. In acting class, remember, I have some students here. I used to, I used to teach acting. Right? Um, and, um, uh, when I grew up, it was, you know, ch when I told dad about Kojak, he said, w what number? That's what he said. Mm. I said, two. He goes, oh, good, we get two. <laughs> he meant channel two, CBS. Right, right. He also said, try not to do too much on four. 
Because that one, you know, the rabbit ears and the thing like that. <laughs> but now, I was, uh, I was just, I left my kids uh, the, uh, at home, my four, my four kids, and I, so I was just searching on streaming, this sort of stuff. There's a revolution. When I, was, when I was teaching, I remember there was pilot season. I hated teaching during pilot season because everyone would get crazy. Mm -hmm. Everyone would come in nuts, you know? <laughs> I got an audition. Artists by night and pilots by day. <laughs> One of our students became a pilot, right? Yeah. I said, why don't you become a pilot? And he did. <laughs> uh, uh, and I, I hated that, but now there is so, it's such a wonderful time for, for, uh, for actors. There's so much, uh, it's, a, it's um, a revolution. It is indeed. Um, so I, I talked to you last week briefly and I asked you if there was anything specific you wanted to address beyond what I would normally ask. What did I say? And you did reference um, an appearance on Tales from the Crypt, which I was unaware of, from 1990 um, in an episode called Dead Right and opposite Demi Moore, which I, had, I used to watch that show but I had not seen this episode. And I asked you why that episode was so impactful in this character, and it's very fascinating. It's actually on YouTube if you can find it, but tell me a little bit about what stayed with you about that character. It was a character called Charlie Marneau. There was not one aspect of my life that, was, uh, 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 that hadn't changed because of makeup. I was completely, and he was 300 to 400 pounds. I, every time I, I tell it, I add another 100 pounds. <laughs> and he was Sports ugly. He was very and angry. I think one of the things about human beings is that there's an ugly in us that we always think, oh, that is ugly. Mm -hmm. not, not, not facially, but that part is ugly or that story is ugly. And, that, and so there was something about him being so ugly. And when I would get out of my trailer and walk to the set in Los, downtown Los Angeles, people would shy away <laughs> and people would be horrified. And there is something... I would say if there's one trait to my acting or my casting is I love the underdog. If there's a, a contest, uh, I'll always root for who's behind. And I love helping the other, you know. Uh, uh, the, you know. And so um, that became, I remember sobbing after the old cut in there because I went, that was my total, my, my first time of, in my acting life where I touched the ugly a little bit. And I've carried that character with me because I think that's a part of living. Am I making any sense to you? Of course, yes. You know, yeah. uh, and I, I think uh, that's a, any writer, that's what the great actors, the real great actors are the ones who are not afraid to hit that undertow a little bit. And that's where I really, uh, I, I hit it. Uh, it was the first time. Um, I don't know why this came up, but when I was a, a young kid, I went over to my friend's house in San Francisco, and I guess her name is Carol or something like that, and her mother says, Carol, who's here? And Carol says, Jeffrey Tambor. Carol, come upstairs. Carol goes upstairs. Carol comes downstairs and says, you have to go. I said, why? She said, my mother said, you're the people who killed Christ. How old were you? 10, 11. I walked home. This is the horrifying part of it. I walked home and we were sitting that night. And my parents were our, our, our second generation. You know, um, dad, dad's Hungarian, mom's Russian. I mean, their, their heritage. And I told them this story. And I remember them. I'm here, and I remember them locking eyes, and that, that horror in their eyes. And that was a signal moment for me, mm. because I went, uh, you know. So you saw ugly very early on. I saw so. what otherizing can really do. You were one of few Jewish kids in your neighborhood. It wasn't, this Oh, there wasn't, wasn't a Jew for miles. Right. Yeah. right. So you definitely felt on the outskirts of what, you, what kids would perceive as normalcy back then. Yeah. Yeah, so anyway, to make a long story short, is, uh, is that, uh, that, that, that Charlie Marneau, that, you know, you're the people who killed God, got me in touch with, you know, uh, with that. I, I think that's a, uh, I'm, I don't know, I like protecting the other. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can see. 
1992 starts what you call the trifecta, which I think is funny. Larry <laughs> Sanders arrested and transparent, which we'll get to those last two. I sure miss Gary Shandling. Oh, um, I yes. You know, uh, it was about this Joe this Lewis. Time last year, almost, or a little bit after. Uh, it's a year away. ago. Yeah. Uh, June. I think. June. Right. Yeah. How did you How did you feel that day? Because I, I remember I was at the Burbank Airport flying to well, Seattle. Well, this is a little too so weird, sad. so to me to say it, because you're going to go. No, oh, come on. But honestly, and you can ask my editor this, that was the day we started writing Gary. Oh. Wow. And she called me the next day and goes, you know what happened? You know when that happened and everything? Anyhow, I don't want I sure missed him, though, at the Hollywood Walk of... I, can I tell you a Gary thing? When I got the Golden Globe... <laughs> you don't Globe, have to ask permission to talk. <laughs> uh, We're I'm, here to When hear I got the Golden Globe, uh, he texted me. And he, his, the text was... I'm standing in my kitchen crying. He was the kindest. After he passed, everybody, everybody would come up to me and just say, you know, Gary helped me on this, uh, you know, on this and this and this and this and this and this. He, he helped everybody. He was kind of quietly sort of a good Samaritan. Yeah. I, I didn't know that about oh him. Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, he helped people in books. He helped people stand up. He helped people. He was behind the scenes, in the, you know, and he led his own life. He didn't, you know, yeah. I couldn't get him to guest star in anything I was doing. Yeah, I, I just, he just, he... He was something. You know, if I, if I can tell you just one thing that I learned, you know, the thing that, about Gary is that he got me. You know, and I think that secret to this business, that if there's any secret to it all, is, uh, or one of the secrets, be with people who get you. And, you know, because I remember as a young actor, I always tried to get the person who didn't get me to get me. And guess what? You can't. You can't. And I would always be on that commercial set where people were going like that, and the one guy like this who voted against you. And I spent my whole day trying to please that <laughs> son of a bitch. And you have to work with people who get you and whom you get and put those other people on a shelf and take them down for Hanukkah and Thanksgiving. <laughs> and that's it. It's a big lesson. It took me years to learn that. It's a great lesson. Yeah. What did you learn specifically about comedy from Gary that you didn't know before? Because the show was obviously so strange. The he tone took was... me to school on, you know, there was a show within a show. Right. I like The Tonight Show. And I was the kid who overprepared. I was the kid who, uh, uh, in school at San Francisco State, I underlined, I underlined every line in the book. So basically, when I studied for my <laughs> midterm, I had to read the book again. <laughs> Um, and he took me aside and said, now look, you can't prepare this. I don't want it to be prepared. Let it happen. And he did a magic thing every night, um, every night we did the show. He would arrange the, all the cue cards, and it was the same guy who wrote the cue cards who did Johnny Carson. It was Johnny Carson's cue card guy. And he wrote them, and he would go like this, he would go. And he would pick his, his, his jokes. And I would call, I would say, every night he does that, call me, because I want to see that. Mm -hmm. Because it, it was a, like an acting book. Because it was all about in the moment. And he was all about the misstep. And, 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 and going past the joke for character revelation. And I always thought that was comedy, but got, I was getting talked out of it. Well, you'd come from multicam too, where you're just a completely different art, what you'd been experiencing. There was no art shows. in what I did. <laughs> I, mean, I just want to make that clear. Uh, um, it's a different format, we'll right. say. A different and format. so, uh, uh, and he, he loved that. He just, he loved that. Did he, did he want you to improv when you were acting? Nope. Okay. Not improv. No, no, no. The right, it was all written. Same with Mitch. Same with, same with Jill. People come up to me and go, now you make all that up, right? No, <laughs> no. That's what the, why, why the, the, what the art is. But what's interesting uh, with that trifecta is all three of those people believe in, in the moment right. and believe in, and I say this in the, the most artistic way, play. You come to play. You come to interact. All the mistakes are right, all the things like, you know. And um, uh, uh, especially Transparent is, 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 a, is a set that I, I've never encountered. It's, it is the safest set I've ever been on. Well, you've been there. Yes. And, and it, it's, amazing. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's, a, it, it's amazing. It's Let's a put stuff. a pen in Transparent for a sec. We're going to come back to it. <laughs> I don't know why my feelings just got hurt, but that's okay. <laughs> no, because we have so much of that to talk about. 
Um, but it was very funny, last month we did a panel at Outfest and Jill revealed that she'd written a spec script for Larry Sanders that for centered on Hank selling yeah. lotions. I am. So this is 20, 25 years ago that she was writing a spec script for your character and now yeah. let's talk about Here. full circles. So yeah. that was my favorite thing I learned that day. So Arrested Development, 2003, a very odd show. <laughs> A very odd show for network television. I remember exactly when it premiered. I was like, what is this weird format and this Ron Howard's voice? And what is this? It, it was such an odd show. And I did struggle to sort of find its footing at first. When you first read the pilot, Mitch, I assume, sent you the pilot. No. How did you get the pilot? No, no, very yeah. few people know this story. I was doing a, a, a film called Hellboy. I was in, in, in Prague. I came back. I had, I had a European phone, and I, I checked my... American phone and getting off the rent. Hiya, pal. Hey, uh, what are you doing Monday? Can you come down and help us out and uh, maybe uh, play uh, the father of this family? Uh, this guy and he's named George Senior. I was just I was a day player, right. and and um, I actually had a, a pilot uh, for uh, uh, channel uh, number two, channel two. <laughs> uh, that was about. Leslie's here about a dentist or something. I mean, was, even they were saying this won't go. As we were filming it, they said this won't go. Uh, um, and um, and so, and there's a there's an acting lesson in that too because I went well I'm a day player and I'm playing George Senior and you remember I, I, I went to work and I put on this orange suit, this prison suit, and I got to do high fives with prisoners and talk to this. One who's practically become my son, Jason Bateman, and uh, uh, and uh, it, it was uh, it was amazing. But there was something very interesting about that day that I was uh, as always be a day player, always be a day player. Because when you when you when you have a long contract, you won't be as you go at the end of the day. I'm going home, right. you know. So there it is. It, it goes like this. So that was a good lesson for me. But I remember doing a couple of scenes, and I'm going. And I know there was a little talk as we were doing the scenes because something, it was really kind of magical. And um, the, the head of Imagine Then, David something, uh, uh, was, and they said, uh, anyhow, luckily Channel 2 went belly up <laughs> and they said, uh, will you, uh, we would like to have you. Uh, how many would you like to do out of 13? And I said, oh, 13. <laughs> so I was very lucky, but always be once. a day player. Yeah. Now, now, when you were making the show, and I talked to Tony Hale and Alia Shawkat about this recently, I said, did you, did you guys know what you were making? I mean, did you have a sense of the, I hate to use the word zany, but it is very zany. Did you have a sense of the tone, or were you surprised when you actually saw the show and you thought, oh, this is what Mitch was doing? You know, I'm not good in that area. Uh, I did know that Larry Sanders was going to be a big hit, more than anybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, arrested, I just went, this is the, I remember going, Tony Hale. That is the funniest person I have ever seen. <laughs> David Cross, that's the funniest people I've ever And I just remember Very just the feeling. And you have to understand that I would come to work, put on an orange suit, zip it up, <laughs> and go up to an attic and play with dolls as George Sr. I mean, you get in line for this kind of work. <laughs> Jesus. And did you actually watch the show every week when it was airing? You read the book because Jason got mad at me. I don't watch myself. Uh, I'm having trouble just watching just the baldness <laughs> out of the corner of my eye there. I'm not great. Uh, I come from the theater. Uh, I, I still probably have still, pro well, no, I've probably done less theater now than films and stuff. But uh, I, I did a lot of theater hours. And in my, my body, once you send it, it's sent. What do you have to look at it for? You know? And I'm not good at looking at it. You know? What are you most critical of when you see yourself? Oh, myself. <laughs> No, I just don't like the optics. Uh, um, it always feels more than what it is. And, and so I like what it feels like interior. Um, I don't know, I like interior. You know, you know, there's this new thing that now, after every play, they have uh, talks. Talk back. Right. Eh, they gotta cut that stuff. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> You know, there's a wonderful thing of holding, holding the experience. I love holding the experience. And to me, when I watch it, it has no, I mean, I'll go, there it is. Um, I, actually, the first time I went to Daly's was Justice for All. And they had to walk me around the city of Baltimore till four in the morning, because I went, 
that's the worst acting I've ever seen in my <laughs> life. Because it was dailies. I didn't know how to watch dailies, right. you know. Did I answer your question? You did, sure. Um, so Transparent, which at Outfest we discussed, um, I actually asked everyone on the panel, I said, what do you consider your big break in, in the business? I, didn't, I wasn't even talking I about Transparent. I actually yes. rethought that. Okay. Uh, you asked that question that night, and I said meeting Jill and everything, which yeah. was transformative. Right. I mean, no pun intended. It, yes. just, uh, it was a, an amazing thing. But I, the moment that I knew I was going to be an actor, uh, I was at Aptus Junior High School, and I was doing a play called Elmer Across, Across the Footlights. Footlights. Mm -hmm. and, uh, there, and all of a sudden, I started to do this improvisation. I started to take off, and I was doing this. And I came from a a rough family. It wasn't warm and fuzzy. Uh, um, and, uh, and I was, I just, all of a sudden I just took off. Now I wasn't paying as much attention to the script as I should be. I was kind of doing my own thing. And the actress I was playing with, was in junior high school, walked out and said, Mr. Privatoni, Mr. Privatoni. It was Mr. Prav, we called him. Mr. Privatoni, he's not doing it right. <laughs> and Mr. Prav said from the back of the house, Leave him alone, he knows what he's doing. <laughs> and it was the first time in my life that anybody had said that to me. And it was the first time that I went, I do know what I'm doing. <laughs> I know what I'm doing. So that was the answer. I'm so glad we got to replay that. <laughs> <laughs> Did you actually think about that, like in the last month? You sort of reevaluating? I replay paper? everything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But what you had said at the time was, and it obviously it still holds true, is that the show was a watershed moment for you in terms of... Leslie the, Siebert, yes. Joni Burstein, who are here tonight... Sent His power me. team is here. Power team, <laughs> Team Campbell. Uh, 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 Leslie said, game changer. She's only said that twice. Uh, you know, uh, and and uh, the other one was... Um, was that porn thing we did? No. Um, <laughs> was, um, arrested, was, uh, I'm was arrested. And uh, so uh, uh, read it. I, I was on the way to the Fairmont Hotel. I, was, I remember I was walking. Uh, I was riding past Whole Foods. And I re because I remember saying and calling her and saying, I, I, I'm doing this. Well, read it, read it. I went, no, no, I'm, we're doing this. Next day, I, I did a show called The Talk. <laughs> right after that, I went to a place on Ventura Boulevard called Pan Quotidian. There was, uh, there was uh, Jill, who had just uh, uh, come off of uh, um, Afternoon Delight. And I literally threw myself at her. She couldn't get it. She would say, so what's it? I said, I'm in. No, no, what it's about, it's about, uh, I'm in. I kept saying, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. I threw myself because I knew that this thing, and I wasn't, even to the Mora stuff yet, uh, uh, I just, I went, th there was something about it. And I've always been intuitive about that. And I do like a high diving board. I do. <laughs> and I mean, talk about protecting the other. Holy moly. And I, I just went, I had the same thing when I met Hank. I had the same thing when I met Mora. I went, there's my friend. There she is. I, I knew that, you know. Uh, there, there's something about it. And then you've met Jill. You look into these eyes, and they're so clear and radiant. And there was just, and I knew that, I knew that thing was going to. She knew exactly what she wanted to, which absolutely. is probably the most attractive thing for an actor. Oh, it was, it, it, and I remember that first season, if you've seen it, there was a barbecue scene where we're all smearing barbecue all over. Everybody. And I remember looking at, I didn't know Jay Duplass. And there's Gabby Hoffman. Never Hoff. acted before, so you wouldn't I, have, you I, wouldn't I, have and known. There's, and there's uh, Amy Landecker, whom I did uh, act with before. But, and they're just killing it. I mean, I'm going, hey, there's genius everywhere I'm looking. And, and there's Jill and Jim Frona. And I'm going, oh my, here, here we go. And I've always, always felt that way about that show. I knew it was going to. There's just something. I don't know if there is a more important time to do comedy right now. Mm. <laughs> comedy that exposes and heals. And in the laughter, you expose and you protect. You protect, you know? And, and, and I can't think, I mean, I think Aristophanes was more important than Sophocles. Because in Lysistrata, 
Aristophanes is, I mean, very few of us have, have fucked our mothers. So <laughs> that's Sophocles. <laughs> or is that Aeschylus? I know who it's, Oedipus. <laughs> is that Sophocles? Sophocles, thank you. Um, uh, but all of us know what it is to go to war. And Aristophanes wrote Lysistrata about that. And so I think that, I don't mean to sound all puffy, but I think, not, I mean, it's like a mission statement to go to work on transparent. It's just like, take that, you know? Especially now with the, the transgender military nonsense and things like that, just expose, 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 you know? And what's wonderful about Jill is she doesn't go like that. But lives are being led. I told you about the executive that came up to me on the airplane? No, how did I say This guy was all zenia. I was in, you know, um, in business or first or wherever I was. And, and the guy, he's just all the hair and the cufflinks and the shoes and the CEO. You know, and he went, you, right there, you, hold it, right there. I went, here it is. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. And I have gotten it a bit, you know. Uh, and uh, I, here he comes. And he grabbed me. There were people that he grabbed me he says, Thank you. Thank you for teaching me something I had no idea about. Wow. Now that's powerful. Wow. And that, that will, that's, that's what goes. And when you see season four, you know what's great about Jill is that she doesn't do, okay, season three plus 10%, because we want you to like us. She goes, here, here's all the cards, and they're on the table. Because season four, have you seen any of it? I've seen four and five. Holy yeah, moly, really papoli, chipoli. <laughs> we don't want, no spoilers. It's really no spoiler. good. It's really good. So you, you've said that, um, this is my favorite line that you've said about playing Mora, that she makes you cranky. And playing her makes you feel like you have a loose rope around your neck. And I want to know how much of that, it, it's you wanting to get it right, which obviously makes sense, but how much of that is you also knowing that you aren't a trans woman playing this part. And oh, that's good. I'm this, glad you said that. Yes, there is a bit of... Uh, enormous pressure. There, there's, there is a little bit of like, how dare I? Because at the end of the day, I will take off my costume and I will put on my cisgender costume. And, uh, you know, it's very interesting. I was telling you in the green room, it's very interesting. I'm playing another role uh, even as we speak. And the other day, I was sitting and I went, I was sitting there and I went, oh my God, you're sitting as Mora. Uh, 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 it's a whole different project, and I was just like, it's so interesting that now I have to kind of adjust to play male, and uh, Mora is sort of with me all, all, all the time. What's your question? No, the, the, the crankiness that you Okay, so you the feel. crankiness, I'll be really honest. The crankiness comes from, I want to get it right, and I get in a bad mood. I'm cranky, and I want to get it right, and, and I think the other part is... Um, well, let me, let me backtrack a sec. So in the book, um, you describe a very awkward Q&A event that you'd been to, where a trans woman went up to the microphone and actually said that you playing this part is akin to blackface. Yeah. Which, that's, oh. that's intense in that, you know, we can interpret that how we may. But, but you know that, what, I'm glad it happened. That really stuck I, with me. But I knew it was going to happen. Right. It was over there, and I could feel it. And uh, Peter, Porter, Peter Benizeski is here. He <laughs> had to almost carry me in my car. Because I knew it was going to happen. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I, I knew it was going to happen. I actually... I was actually happy that it happened because I went, thank God it's here. And she stood up and she said it. And, and, she, and, and I, I went into shock. And it was as if my mom and dad had said it. I mean, it was just, it just so this shook after me. after season one and was already out? Season one, okay. yeah. Uh, what's wonderful about, well, I'm still cranky adjacent. <laughs> okay. uh, I'm cranky. Uh, and, um, but I think what has happened is I think we, and I mean we, have garnered an um, amount of trust. And, and people understand that our intentions are honorable. I am an uh, ally of the transgender community. Uh, um, and ally implies action. Uh, and I, uh, and uh, that's all I can ever be. I mean, I will never, you know, you say, people come up, every once in a while I'll get a hit. But, and, or everybody, but. From trans people themselves? No, or I get, I get, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, people come up to me, my life now is I'll go to, uh, I'll go to a, 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 a shopping and people will come and take me and say, can I talk to you for a second? And they'll tell me about their lives or they'll tell me about their children who are considering changing or incidences in their life. Or things, or just about their family. You could be the only person they have to talk to about it. Well, it's you know, so interesting lives. because we're hitting 
people on an unconscious level. You understand? And I was at Sundance, where you and I, we, we, and uh, uh, these people came up and said, we're big fans. And I said, oh, thank you. And she goes, no, no, no. Can we talk to you for a second? And we need to tell you something. And what? what? Um, well, your performance uh, and your show, uh, our, our son was going to b baseball. And he was coming home. And uh, he said to us, Mommy, Daddy, don't, don't make me go back there anymore. I, I don't want to go back to playing baseball anymore. And they said, well, why? And he said, Mom, Dad, I'm not a boy boy. <coughs> what do you mean, they said. And he, he said, I want to grow up, and I want to be different. And uh, it was our show that helped them uh, through that. Well, what, what else do you need? Right. That's amazing. And I'm sure the, the, there are stories you don't even know about, people every day discovering the show, maybe watching in private. because. On the other aren't. hand, you know. there is the odd tweet that goes, how dare you? Right. Well, so, we don't care about those people. Just delete those Well, people you know first. what? No, no, no. <laughs> but you know what? Care about those people. Because those are the people who... Those are the people that my, my 12-year-old, my 10-year-old, and my two seven-year-olds are going to change the world. And those people will just be left behind. Because we won't tolerate that nonsense anymore. Right. This is fun. <laughs> I'm loving this. So yeah, Actually, I'm trying to remember the singer that, that, they, that they said. Katie it's Perry. Katy Perry. Mommy, Daddy. Thank you. Who was that? Jack. Hi. <laughs> oh, hi. Um, I have to talk to you about something. Um, um, Mom, Dad, I want to grow up and be like Katy Perry. Oh, wow. That's what was so killer. That's amazing, isn't it? And yeah. obviously, Mora is very much in your bones and in your, in your muscles and in your brain. I think she's changed me. I think she's well, made you just, me. You just took my question. I was going to ask how she changed you. <laughs> We're not getting along. <laughs> no, you're just too good at anticipating all my questions. Go ahead. <laughs> no, Say but I, I, how has she changed you as a person, but also how has she changed the, the work that you want to do? I mean, do you, do you see everything through a more strict lens of, is this an important part? And why do I want to take this? And if I do this, what am I getting out of this? I mean, is, is she kind of whispering in your ear? Yeah. I mean, I think I've noticed that my, uh, my humor has become different. I've noticed that my word power has become different. Um, I think I'm a better daddy. I think I'm a better actor. I think she raised the stakes on it, that I had to kind of get better. I mean, she, she kind of had to say, come on, come along. Let's go. Let's uh, ante up. Give it, give it, you know, not, there, there are ten fingers on these hands, not just one finger. Let's go. And so, uh, and it's everything I thought acting would be. And I think acting is you have to be bothered. To really act, you have to be, it has to bother you. And she bothers me. Well, she makes I, you cranky, so that's She makes me cranky. Right. Uh, she can't find home base. And there's another part that I know more than anybody else, more than Jill, more than anybody else. She's 70. And she has found her authenticity at a later age. And that's an interesting, and I've had women of age come and talk to me about that and how much they appreciate that. To find your authenticity and to find your, 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 your sort of, your, your sexual authorship, and also the clock is going tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, <laughs> is a very interesting dilemma to play. And why wouldn't you be cranky? Because <laughs> well, you're a teenager in a 70 right. year old body. Right. You understand? Right. You don't know how to put on your makeup, and you're 70. It's a delayed adolescence. You don't, you, you're putting on false eyelashes, and you're giggling, and yet you have to put cream on your knee. <laughs> Isn't that, that's so check off. <laughs> it's, so, it's so rich and wonderful, right? But I do get cranky. I do. And are there roles you won't play now because you feel you want to spend your time doing important stuff, or ideally important stuff? Well, I'd like to go out uh, with Mora. I mean, I thought I was going to go out with Lear, but it's going to be Mora. <laughs> I will do more until they just say, uh, T, lock the door. Get him out of here. 
and understand what he's saying. What is this <laughs> blathering idiot. I, I, uh, uh, she changed my life, Jill. It has changed my life, and uh, everything else is through that, through that perspective. I think she's, I don't know. I mean, it's like when, when we first made up at the, the Fairmont Hotel, and it was so funny that we, we made up, uh, Zachary uh, Drucker and, and Reese Ernst were there, and Jill, and, and they were actually filming it. I think Jim Fronin was there, and we were gonna go out to a, a, to a club and dance. And I remember first coming into makeup, and I remember thinking, and Maura and I were very shy. We would not look. And when we looked, we kind of liked it, you know, and it was very, and I, I, I it, you know, it's like, friendship is so rare, you know, it's a real rarity to, to have a friend, but when you have a friend that's a, you know, character is sort of summoning you, let's, you know, she's far, much farther along than I am, and, and so she's, she's sort of coaching, me. it sounded like a life coach, like, let's get going. <laughs> um, right. And so that was uh, that night was really really an inter interesting night. And that was the first night you went out in public as Mora. Yeah, and we went to the uh, Oxwood to dance, uh, and that was very interesting. And then I went to Gelson's. Uh, my the next, ultimate test to go to the My next store, trip, right? and I went uh, and I went. I, I dressed up and I went and we went down the uh, Zachary just left me alone, and I wanted to go shopping as Mora. I know that sounds real actory and actor class. <laughs> But I, I, do, I do teach that. And, and so uh, let's find out what, what, what Maura would buy and everything. And, and, and Maura was overdressed, which I think she would overdress for Gelson's. <laughs> um, to the salad bar, you know. And <laughs> eating the feta. You know. <laughs> and I remember uh, walking down this aisle and this one guy looked at me. And I don't know if he recognized me as Jeffrey Tambor dressed up as Maura. I don't know if, whether he recognized Maura. I don't know what it was, but the look on his face was so evil. It was a smile, but it was not a friendly smile. And I remember saying, take that to the bank. Whatever that, whatever that was, that, whatever that look is, and it wasn't clocking, it wasn't that. It was evil. But then we went outside and we sat at the table and Zachary said, go sit over there. And there was somebody already there, it was a man who was texting, I'm like, sit over there. And we <laughs> sat and we ate a chicken salad. And, and he was texting, he looked up, looked at me, looked up and did his texting, and he went, okay, well, have a, have a nice day, ladies. And he left, and we high-fived. <laughs> we, we were just like, it was great. Ultimate compliment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we have a lot of great audience questions. I want to make sure we get to them. Okay. Okay, you're going to have to wait and hear these questions before you offer answers, Jeffrey. Okay. okay. <laughs> this first one from Suzanne Wong. And she says, you are a magnificent acting teacher, which I know firsthand as a former student. Hi, Suzanne. Where, where are you? Where are you? There she is, kind of in the back. What have you learned about acting from your experience teaching actors? It's a great question. Oh, you know, I said this at the, uh, the, the, uh, when they gave me uh, the star. I, there were a, a few actors there. And I just said, um, uh, the irony is, you guys thought I was teaching you. <laughs> but you were teaching me. And I have carried those lessons and those scenes and our missteps and our, our solving problems together have been in my back pocket all the way. And that's the truth. Every teacher in this room knows that, is that you're always learning from your students. And your words of advice are always coming from your students. So I'm glad we rehearsed this, you and I, just now. <laughs> it nice felt very you. natural. I would have never known. Wonderful actress, by the way, and wonderful stand-up comedian. Um, Tammy Taylor, who has my favorite name of any attendees at these events. Friday Night Lights in the house. Hi. Um, Hi, Tammy. Tammy says, my first boyfriend back in 75 is a trans woman today. Getting to know her as a woman has been a real learning experience. Is there anything you'd do differently you, if you started this role today playing Maura? Brilliant characterization. The irony is... What has happened in four years, I think it would be a misstep for me to take on this role right now. Mm. And honestly- The optics of you playing this part. Not the optics, oh. just the, the justice of it. Mm. And let's say I'm a good actor. Let's say I'm an eight. There are eights around. But you know what? 
I'll take a six. I'll, you, you understand, I think it's time to be affirmative in our casting. So that's what I've learned. You know, um, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I've gained a lot, and the timing was, was right. It was just. But right now it's, you know, and as you, as you knew in the Emmy, <laughs> when I, I, I said, in Hebrew, I said to the orchestra, Sheket Bavakasha, <laughs> and they stopped, <laughs> which meant they were an all Jewish orchestra. <laughs> I did not know what you, what did you say? Because I don't know what that means. Means, uh, shut up, be quiet. <laughs> and I didn't even know I knew Hebrew. Uh, uh, and I said, uh, I would not be unhappy were I to be the last tra uh, the cisgender uh, actor to play a transgender role. Uh, but here's what has to happen, is that the writers in, in, in the room need to start writing. And, and the studio, they gotta, they, they gotta grow some and they gotta throw down. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Come how much on. Of this is, how much of this is, is part of the casting process itself? I mean, oh, yeah, well, well, we have Edie, you know, Edie Belasco, and she, she's just a killer, and she, she just, you know, and, and, and Jill, you must come see our set. That's funny if I invited <laughs> you all, like bosses coming onto the set. Oh, they're my friends, yes. Um, but you must, I mean, because we have such a transformative set, you know, uh, but I am, a, I am about that's, that. That's a very rare place. Well, mean, here's, what, here's yeah, what I'm against. Here's what place, I'm against. So, yeah. I am against... I want, oh, it sounds like I'm blowing my own horn. I had the honor of teaching an acting class at the LGBT Center this year. I've done it now two years, I'm gonna do it again. There is so much talent in that room. So this is not about, you know, oh come on, give me a, you know. There is real talent in this room and I, I would rather that my wonderful friends don't play the third barista on the left. I want them or to have meaty roles. Or get killed, or right. get I mean, all these tropes that I think exactly. we're all tired of seeing. I want, yeah. uh, so that's, that's what I want, and uh, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, let's go. Um, this is from April Sugarman. What another great name. Wow, it's a great name. No, great I, name. Of course, <laughs> I remember you. Hi, how Sugarman. are you? Um, April would like to know, what was the most pivotal moment in your career? Maybe we've already touched on it, perhaps. When you reached the moment in your career where you felt like you were stumbling, what did you do to propel yourself forward? How did you not quit? Uh, the moment where I went, oh, something's broken, was I was doing uh, Hill Street Blues, and I played Judge Wachtell, who was a cross-dresser, by the way. Well, he was, he was just insane. Uh, I mean, it, he didn't even cross-dress. I mean, it wasn't, uh, uh, he just, anyhow. And I remember I used to run uh, 10 miles a day, and I was running, and I was going over the lines, but I was going over the lines I had just shot. And I stopped and I went, oh, you're broken. You can't, you can't, I know it sounds small, but I went, you cannot lead your life this way. You cannot. Is that because you were obsessing about what you had just shot? Absolutely. Okay. And it's just that thing. And I went, you have to change, you have to change your way. And, and, and that's when Gary came along and said, you not only have to change your way, change your way. Uh, but, but that obsessiveness helped to inform Hank so perfectly. I mean, had you not been in that sort of cycle, that you may not have been perfect to play the, as perfect to play the role. I mean, that's why he wanted you for it. Well, uh, yeah, I also, in the audition, uh, had a moment where uh, Gary read with me and Francine Maisler was, uh, was videotaping it, and um, there was a moment where Gary's character was to leave the room and I was supposed to say something, but instead during the audition, I picked up a, a couch, a couch, <laughs> and picked it up and I put it in the doorway to stop him. And he stopped and he looked at Francine Maisler and I was cast. Because you were the strongest person who had but then, <laughs> But later that day, I called him around four or five o'clock and I called him at the gym and they put me through and I went, um, I, I need to play this role. Uh, and you know, he was still out of breath. And I said, I know, uh, I know it sounds weird, but I, I need to play this role. I, I, I just, I have to play Hank. And I said, I, I don't make calls like this. I never done this. And he said, no, but Hank would. <laughs> so always bother people. <laughs> oh, I'm a big one, right? I'm a big one. People don't know 
If you don't, if you don't go like this, people won't know. You have to bother. Except after tonight, don't bother him. Yeah, don't bother him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he needs to get home, so he does not have enough time for that. Um, this is a, a question from Shane, a very specific question, which I love. Um, Shane asks, what did you learn working with Anthony Hopkins on Meet Joe Black? Uh, is this Shane Edelman? No, it's Shane. Oh, hi. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, in the reading, I, could, I was sitting there in the reading in New York at this fancy schmancy hotel, and I, 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 I kept saying, oh my God, I'm in a movie with Anthony Hopkins. <laughs> that was the first thing. Here's, here's what was inter interesting about him, is that he got it in the first five takes. And he knew that about himself. And he'll tell you that. Uh, and uh, um, he, he, he told us all. It's in the first, it's my first five takes. And, and, and that's where the gold is. And I've worked with actors who are in the 20s and the 30s. And I like 20s and 30s. I love when missteps happen and things like that. But I did learn about uh, trust. Your, uh, and it's so interesting because I've become a little, I love my first take now. I like the uninformed take. You know, you know does that mean, it? yeah. And, and uh, terribly nice guy uh, and terribly modest. And uh, God, he was good. Yeah, he was uh, just a lovely, lovely guy. AJ would like to know, um, taking Ron Howard and the Grinch as an example, have you noticed a difference working with a director who is also an actor? Um, uh, well, Ron is truly one of the, I don't know why it went right to it, but it, Ron loves actors so much that, did anybody ever see the Grinch? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the, Ron came, on the set one day dressed as the Grinch. <laughs> That's four hours of makeup in. Oh my God. And I think he did that for Jim. I think he did that just to support Jim. Was that a hard shoot? Because of all oh. the moving parts and everything? Four o'clock in the morning, and the first thing that you put on is your ears <laughs> with the glue. And I went, well, I'll be able to listen to classical music. And that's what I'll do. I'll just listen to classical music. The first thing they put on is the ears. And um, I, I tell you, I never want to see Christmas lights again. I, 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 I had enough of Christmas. But I will tell you something about Ron uh, and, and the people he worked with. Um, you want to work with people who challenge you, but you know, if you just go like this and you put your arm, all my students are going, oh God. Um, you, you put your arm and you, let, you rest it, that support, you got to work. That has to be your director, who 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 lets you in your process, who 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 gets you. I I um. Very early on my career, in my career, uh, a director who wanted to come at me, but he was afraid to, went to an under five player, guy who had five lines, and ripped him to shreds. And I remember that kid. He had just the sweat stains under each armpit. And I went home that night and I said, I will never allow that to happen again. I didn't protect that kid that day. And I'm sure that kid quit show business. And I, you, you gotta be kind. You gotta, you gotta be kind. Uh, it, it just, you just gotta. You can give a note. You can give a note that will go whoa. You understand? That will wake you up. But you got to be kind in the delivery. I am done with that stuff. I'm done with ADs. I'm done with actors. Actors who treat other actors shabbily. I am, I am tired of it. This, you know, I mean, I can't think of a time when we have to come together as artists more than right, right now. And the way we, I mean, the way we, it's just, I just, uh, I don't like temper tantrums. I don't like, you know, I, I remember coming to, uh, I'm the guy who thanks people for coming on the set. This is tough. Those two lines, that person is shaking, is just shaking for those like two lines. Like a day player lines. or something. Yes. You know, I remember, I'm the guy who, fro his mouth froze. 
And Do you I'm say not, I'm the talking anus around here, and yeah. people are like put at ease? And I'm just saying, you know, I mean, is and I, my people know I can be cranky. I, I've seen I, you being I, cranky. Oh, before. I can be. Yeah. You were there when I was cranky that was. day. Uh, and it was amazing. I, <laughs> but be kind in your process. Yeah. Be kind. Know that these, you know. What's the difference between cranky and unkind? Like cranky is sort of internal. Unkind is when you're kind of making other people suffer around you, which I have not witnessed. So. Right. The, the night is young. <laughs> 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 okay, two more questions left. This is a great question from Beth. Uh, Beth would like to know, what is the best and worst thing about doing voiceover work for animated programs or Best films? thing is that you can wear anything <laughs> you want. You can wear shorts and you're, you, and uh, there, uh, Gosh, I don't know if there is any worse thing about it. I really love doing that. Uh, when I did SpongeBob, it was my first time I, I'd ever done it, and I'm, I'm good, I'm, I'm okay. But those guys, I remember they were doing like riffs between takes, and they, they could do like doors and seats and lights and <laughs> things like that. They were brilliant, so that's, uh, there are some real artists yes. out, out there. Uh, but I, I love voiceover work. and. Um, you know, it's just fun to sit with your kids in the, in, at the Saturday Theater in New York, you know, at Ridgefield, and just sit there, and the Trolls, you know, uh, <laughs> oh, trolls preview night. comes on, and, and they, n my son Eli goes, is that you? I go, yep. <laughs> <laughs> and do they know that you were in the movie? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. okay. I, I'm, you know, that's why I wrote this. That's why it's called, you know, uh, Are You Anybody, is, is because... Um, I wanted to kind of leave behind kind of what daddy does because so far I think they, they just see me sort of mumbling, uh, <laughs> mumbling lines. They can always tell, they say, daddy's mumbling again, that means he's going to work. Did they uh, watch Transparent? Uh, Evie came to the set. And she's 10, you said. She right? was eight, oh, eight. Wow. when she came. And uh, Kasha and I, my wife Kasha, and I looked at each other and went, hmm. Wants to come to set. Uh, who? Uh, Daddy. Hmm. Dad. Well, we'll show you. Hmm. How? Uh, hmm. How did she react? Uh, and well, she said, "Daddy, I understand your character is more comfortable being a woman." Oh my God. And from the mouth of babes. And she went in. We had a mani pedi together. <laughs> and she gets it. And that same day, my 41-year-old daughter, my 39-year-old daughter. Uh, 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 came to the set and she turned to me and said, and she's tough, and she's tough, she's a professor of European literature and she's toughy, and she said, I am so proud of you. And then she said, and I, I, not to offend, but you're pretty. <laughs> and I, I just burst into tears, you know. So my, uh, my two girls came to the set. You know, it's funny. Um, I grew up in, in a, you know, you know, but I always, I always remember, I always associate, remember we always had food in the acting class, and I was always say, someone bring food during the intermission, and uh, uh, I, I so associate acting in the kitchen together, because I would go to my grandmother's, and all the women would sit together and talk, and I would sit with them, and I would much rather, sit with them than sit with the men who were doing the sports and the thing. I love sports and things like that. But the, what the women were talking about was much more interesting to me <laughs> even then. So I think Mora was in the works all the way. <laughs> I've always been more comfortable uh, around women. You had your feelers up at that point. I don't know what it was, but I think, I think a great, what, but one of the things I've learned, I, let's see if I can articulate this, is that I think a great deal of being male and a great deal of being female is also performance. I, I know there's also the, the whole, you know, the, the, the biology, I get that. But in playing Mora, I was, I'm, it's not that I added any femininity to what I'm doing, it was that I, I was able to drop barriers and be more Jeffrey than I've ever been, which means I'm more happy when I play Mora, <laughs> not when I'm chopping at Gelson's. <laughs> right. um, and this is an apropos final question. Grace would like to know, well, first she says you were my teacher for three years at the Beverly Hills Playhouse. Shen. Shen? Uh -huh. Grace Shen. In the late 90s, and she says you were an amazing teacher. What would you tell your younger self if you could give 
him advice. Mm, that's a great question. Well, first of all, there are no errors. That, that, that's the thing. I mean, I'm as happy, to, I mean, doing, um, th there are no errors. I wish I enjoyed it more at the time. You know, there's that thing that we always talked about, adore everything. And uh, that was a saying of my teacher and his teacher, adore everything. I, I wish I knew that the ball, the, the ball that we all want to go to, is not the ball. That they're at home right now and they're all in, in bed, 12, 10, and two sevens. And that takes a little, a little knowledge where you go, because you go, uh, you, 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 you think, oh, you know, Prince Charming will be there and the red carpet and the things like that. And that's all fun. My wife said to me as we were coming back from a, a very, a, a big party, and we were, you know, and she said, what's going on with you? And I said, I wish I knew. And she said, what? And I said, it's only a party. It's just people at a party. That's all it is. And they're going to go back to their lives, and they're having, you know, they're eating, they're drinking. It's, it's just a party. I made work. such a thing it's out work. of it. It's work. It's the business. That is well, no, no, no. It's just a party. I thought it was like a castle <laughs> and, you know, all of that. And don't right. make it out of that because it is the... Con In Howard's End, the last words are connect, only connect. And that's it. You know that thing when you go to the theater and the lights go to half and then they go out? That's it. And we all go, I'm going to learn a lesson that's going to help me get through the night. And that's what it is. Love one another. Auden said, love one another or die. And that is it. And that's in our acting. And that's, that was too late. I, I got that too late. I, I worried about the, you know, how about take three? It's not take three. It, it's not. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Ado sense. Adore everything. You know, I had 50, I got $55 a week at Wayne State University doing repertory theater. I worked myself to the bone. And I didn't know that I was the happiest actor going. <laughs> you understand? $55 a week, and my God, I walked on, uh, you know, I walked on once in the wrong costume, in the wrong play. <laughs> I walked on, my review for Caliban, I had all these beads on my thing, I thought I was great, it's Caliban, I, and I put chlorophyll on my, on my tongue, so I had this green tongue. <laughs> Jay Carr in the Detroit News said, Jeffrey Tambor's Caliban is a beaded bag gone wrong. <laughs> and without those moments, you would not have had a memoir. So, That's right. So if it had gone swimmingly from day one, we would George E.B., yeah. Jay Carr, here we are. <laughs> well, thank you, sir. I think we I all learned really a lot. I really enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Have fun. <laughs>